Welcome to this introductory video on pumps, uh, fluid machinery, but we're going to really focus on pumps uh, for this course. Uh, we're going to talk about the two general classes of pumps in this video lecture and uh, so, sort of the characteristics of them. So let's go ahead and take a look at your screen. The picture I have here is of a centrifugal pump, and this is the kind of pump we'll spend most of our time on, or pretty much all of our time on in this course. Uh, here's a picture of it, looking at it from the outside. You've got uh, an inlet where uh, liquid would come into this pump and it would kind of swirl, it'd be thrown out to the outside here, be swirling around and then come out here through what's called the uh, volute casing. And then it would go out through the top here. And if you look at the interior of the pump, apologize for the poor quality of this image, but you have what's known as the suction side. This is the fluid would come in here. This would be the low pressure side. And by the way, I should just say at this point, the whole purpose of a pump is to increase the pressure in the fluid, okay? Um, it's, it's a pressure rising device. So uh, it comes in at low pressure and it should go out at a high pressure. The flow rate through the pump doesn't change. The, the flow rate coming in at the inlet and the flow rate going out at the outlet is exactly the same, just from conservation of mass. So a pump does not suddenly speed up the flow from the inlet to the outlet. Um, what the pump does is changes the pressure from the inlet to the outlet, okay? So the flow would come in here with a low pressure and goes into this spinning impeller. So the red thing is the impeller and it spins around and what it does is it throws the fluid to the, to the outside. So the fluid goes, it, it hits that spinning impeller and you know, for example, if you're standing on, uh, let's say, a merry-go-round and you stand out at some radius, um, just from Newton's first law, you want to go in a straight line um, but because the merry-go-round is spinning, it feels like you're being thrown out to the side, right? You're being thrown off the merry-go-round because you want to be moving in a straight line, but the merry-go-round is going around in a circle. So it feels like you're being thrown out to the side, and that's what's happening to the water here. Or the liquid, as it comes at, goes into this impeller, it gets thrown out to the sides, so it's going out through the, the edges here. This is called a closed impeller here because there's a, there's a kind of a cover on it in the front and the back, a shroud on the the front and the back. So it's coming out through this kind of gap in the middle here. It gets thrown out to the side and it, it collects in this volute. This is the, the volute chamber is this kind of blue thing. And it's coming out through here and then it'll end up going out to the out through the top. But as it gets thrown out to the side, that, that kinetic energy, you know, the high speed velocity of that water being thrown out to the side gets converted into pressure because it goes from a high kinetic energy and then the kinetic kinetic energy goes down because um, it's it's no longer spinning. It's just getting thrown out to the sides there. And so it gets converted into pressure. And at the same time, the area also increases. So you have an additional effect of just the, the chain increasing area, like as it's going through the volute. We know from Bernoulli's equation that just turns it into um, additional pressure. And so you end up having a high pressure going out. These kinds of Centrifugal um, pumps are very, very common in practice. Very, very common. And so this is what we'll end up focusing pretty much all of our time on in this course. But for this introductory lecture, I'm going to show you some other pump designs. Okay. So the types of fluid machines, just more generally, that we deal with, we have uh, fluid machines that do work on the fluid. These are things like pumps, fans, blowers, and compressors. They all add energy into the flow. So when you think about the extended Bernoulli equation, that shaft head term, uh, let me move that so it's not interfering with the, the video. So the shaft head term is positive in these cases. We're adding energy into the flow. Okay, So that's one class. And then the other class is where we extract work from the fluid. In this case, the shaft head term would be negative because we're pulling energy out of the extent, uh, flow. So in the extended Bernoulli equation, the HS term for these things up here, pumps, fans, blowers, etc., that's positive, but for turbines, it's negative. So now there's just some terminology differences between these kinds of things. So pumps are typically used for liquids. Fans are used for gases or vapors at a very low pressure changes. So this means that there's a small pressure change across the fan, okay? Uh, blowers have uh, a higher pressure change across them, but they're also used for gases and a vapor. And then compressors are also used for gases and vapors, but have a, a, 
a larger pressure difference across it. So fans, blowers, and compressors all operated on, on gases or vapor, and the difference really just has to do with how much of a pressure rise there is across the device. Across the device. Uh, and then for uh, items that ex uh, devices that extract work from a fluid, we'll, we'll ju they'll just be turbines. Now we're not going to spend any time talking about the details of turbines or or any of these things down here. The one that we're going to sp spend all our time on is pumps. And uh, but the ideas can be uh, very, the ideas for dealing with fans and blowers, compressors, all very similar as pumps. Same sort of thing with turbines, but just in reverse. Um, I mean, there are differences, but um, kind of the big, broad, general strokes are, are very similar. And again, we're going to just focus primarily on centrifugal pumps. It's just there's too much to cover, so we have to just focus on one thing. Uh, you can make an entire career of just learning about pumps. Okay, there's a lot out there. So let me tell you about the different kinds of pumps. Um, we can break those down into two classes, two general classes. We have positive displacement pumps, and we also have dynamic pumps. Now, positive displacement pumps, we'll start with. Um, these devices, um, they, they uh, increase the pressure through changes in volume. Okay, So let me just kind of go through these points, and I'll, I'll talk about some examples. So uh, the force fluid movement, and they increase the pressure through changes in volume. So examples are like a reciprocating piston engine, like an internal combustion engine where the pistons are moving up and down. When it moves down, you pull in air and fuel, right? Uh, because we're using that change in volume to have force atmospheric pressure to push the air and fuel into the, into the cylinder. And then um, the, the, through momentum of the, the, uh, the camshaft, it, the, the piston comes up and then pushes, you know, there's some ignition, et cetera, but it pushes the exhaust gases out. So it's a pump in the sense that, uh, it's a positive displacement pump in the sense that the cylinder and the piston, the piston's moving up and down in the cylinder and it's using changes in volume to, to pump air and fuel in and exhaust gases out. Uh, a heart is an example of a positive displacement pump. Your heart is constantly changing its volume. Um, and, and through a series of valves, you know, you have blood coming into your heart and blood going out of your heart. It's, it's a positive displacement pump. Your lungs, um, actually the diaphragm and lungs are also an example of a positive displacement pump. When, you're, when your diaphragm moves down, then it causes uh, a change in volume and that air, get, air ends up coming in. It's pushed in through atmospheric pressure into your, into your lungs. And then when your diaphragm moves back up, it forces that air out. So it's Again, another example of a positive displacement pump. Gear pumps are another example. This picture I have here is of a gear pump. So the idea here is, uh, you can see it better over here, you have one, one of these gears is the driving gear and the other gear is the driven gear. So let's say this is the driving gear. This one's rotating around and you see it meshes with this driven gear down here. So the flow comes in from the left side and because of the direction that these are rotating, the fluid ends up getting caught in these pockets between the gear teeth and then carried along and pushed out through the outlet. You can't go through the middle because the teeth here, first of all, are headed in this direction. And you can see that there, there's a tight fit here, so there's not going to be any fluid that can easily make its way through this region. So, so you're just forcing the fluid along those paths on the outside and moving along. So this, again, is another example of a positive displacement pump because we're we're using the changes in volume. The changes in volume occur where it's the where it's meshing here, right? So the volume here is fixed, but then as it comes back around, the volume disappears, so it can't stay in there. So that's an example of a, another positive displacement pump, a gear pump. These are often used in like automotive applications and things like that. Uh, a bellows is another example. You know, uh, you may not even be familiar with a bellows any longer, but a bellows is. Uh, one of these things that uh, they use for fireplaces to kind of um, to stoke a fireplace to make the fire bigger to get more oxygen into the fire. It's basically an accordion looking device. Um, an accordion is an example of a positive displacement pump as well. Um, so anyway, many examples of positive displacement pumps. Uh, they typically produce a periodic flow rate through them. Think about your heart. 
it's not a continuous flow of blood through your heart. It, it, it's pulsatile. It goes um, periodically. So that's pretty typical for positive displacement pumps. The nice thing about positive displacement pumps is you can get very large pressure rises across the pump. <clears throat> so the delta P across the pump can be very large, but generally they correspond to smaller flow rates. Okay, so large pressure rise, smaller flow rate. Uh, they often use positive displacement pumps, for example, in the fracking industry, like oil and gas, where they have to pump um, uh, kind of a uh, fracking fluid filled with propent. Propent is like kind of sand-like material at super high pressures down into a well to kind of break open rock deep within the earth to get you know additional natural gas and oil and such out of the ground. But they have to do that at super high pressures. So the only kinds of pumps that can do that sort of thing are these positive displacement style pumps because they get very high pressures across them. Now we're not going to talk about positive displacement pumps much beyond what I've just told you here in the course. Um, but it's, again, a very interesting topic, and there are huge varieties of positive displacement pumps out there. It's really kind of neat to see what people have come up with. So I encourage you to look online just out of your own cu curiosity to see what's out there. Instead, we're going to focus primarily on dynamic pumps. Uh, a centrifugal pump is an example of a dynamic pump. Dynamic pumps rely on changes in fluid momentum to produce the pressurized, just like what I talked about at the beginning with the centrifugal pump, where you, where you take the, the fluid, you spin it up at high speed, has a lot of kinetic energy, a lot of momentum to it, and then that gets converted into pressure as you bring it to rest. Okay, So that's how a dynamic pump works. So there are no closed volumes in, po in dynamic pumps as there were in positive displacement pumps. The change in pressure, the pressure increase, is due to changes in fluid momentum, as I've already just mentioned. So examples of dynamic pumps are like axial flow and radial flow pumps. So a radial flow pump would be the, the centrifugal pump I talked about. An axial flow pump is one like what you see here in this picture. So here's an axial flow pump. Here you have a motor with a drive shaft connected to an impeller, and it's axial flow because the flow is going in the same direction, right? So you can see that we're down in some body of water here, and the spinning impeller here has kind of airfoil shapes to it. And so you, it produces a pressure difference across the, the, the blades of that impeller, and it forces the fluid upward through it. And it's axial because it's all going in the same direction. So, uh, the centrifugal pump that I showed at the beginning here this is a radial flow pump because the, you change the direction. The flow goes out radially. The flow comes in here axially, but it goes out radially. I can't show it very well here, but it's kind of going out radially. And so that's that's called a radial style pump. And then they have mixed pumps that where it, it's, it's not completely axial and it's not completely radial. So it's combination. So that's called a mixed flow pump. All right, let me get back to my list of things here. So um, jet pumps are another example of a dynamic pump. Here what you do is you use actually a high-speed jet of liquid that entrains the liquid around it to move at a higher speed. So that's a jet pump. They're often used, I think, in um, swimming pool applications and things like that. And uh, uh, jet engines, for example, are an example of, like the compressor in a jet engine is an example of an axial flow pump kind of like what we have here, because the flow is going in, um, you know, in a jet engine in, in the compressor part. So here's, there's a, there's a series of compressors here. The, the jet engine, the flow will come in this way and then it'll go that way. So that's another example of an axial style pump, um, the compressor section in a, and, and fan section in jet engine. By the way, the picture here is of one of these axial flow pumps it's an irrigation uh, ditch here, so you've got some water. And I think this picture was taken in Thailand. Um, and what you have here is kind of a long pipe. The bottom of here is this kind of impeller. And then there's a there's a, a belt. I don't know if you can see that clearly here, but there's a little um, sort of pulley here with a dr uh, drive belt attached to this kind of this tractor motor. So this is causing this shaft here, there's a shaft that's running here that's rotating around because of the belt here and that causes the impeller to rotate 
and it pulls the water up actually it's um, yeah so you're getting a flow of water up this way and it's going into irrigating a rice crop so that's just an example of an axial flow dynamic pump so compared to Compared to um, positive displacement pumps, the pressure rise across a dynamic pump is typically less than a positive displacement pump. You can get huge pressure rises across a positive displacement pump. Um, so, you know, these dynamic pumps don't can't get quite as high. You can still get some pretty large pressure rises across a dynamic pump, but not as high as what you get for a positive displacement pump. The flow rate in a dynamic pump is typically continuous. It's not as periodic as you might get in a positive displacement pump. That could be important depending on your application. And the flow rates through dynamic pumps typically tend to be higher than the flow rates through positive displacement pumps. So, um, so you know, there are advantages to using positive displacement pumps. Typically, you know, when you need a high pressure, uh, high pressure rise, um, and, but for you know high flow rate applications a dynamic pump is often typically better so you know there, there's a lot of decisions that go into choosing what kind of pump that you need like i said at the beginning we're going to just focus almost exclusively on centrifugal style pumps because that's it's super common in industrial applications and we've got to start somewhere so that's a logical place to start the very last thing i'll mention here in this introduction is there are a lot of pump tutorials and explanatory videos available on the web. I can only go through just a little bit because of the timing of the course, but it's a huge topic of um, engineering interest, and so there's a lot of information out there. Some really good videos, really good information. I encourage you, if you want to know more about pumps, to take a look at what's online. Um, you'll learn a lot, plus it's, there, there's a lot of neat, you know, innovative things that people have come up with, so I encourage you to take a look at that.